Here we go. Hi guys, everyone. I'm Mark Kent from Osmia Water and Eternal Lake Nature Reserve, and I'm joined by two great minds on water who I've invited for a discussion and just a chat about various questions we want to ask each other, I guess, uh, about water. And I'm joined with uh, Gerald Pollock and George Wiseman. Hello, guys. Hello. Uh, good Good to see you. Nice. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, thanks for accepting it. And George is very uh, again back with me for more updates on what we're doing and then stuff to speak about with with george so welcome george thank you it's good to be here and see you both again awesome so i've um i've been collecting questions and um for jerry and yourself about um we want to talk about uh, the easy water the exclusion zone and we want to ask some more questions about like getting a little bit more deep into some of the questions. Um, but the first one um, I wanted to ask uh, for Jerry is about um, uh, what what tactical ways do you see your work on exclusion zone being incorporated into different therapies for the body, first of all? Um, okay, well, good question. Um, I, I think that uh, from what we've learned and studied over the past couple of decades, uh, easy water is absolutely critical uh, for health and, and function. Your cells are filled with easy water. And um, when, when a cell is, is activated, what, what we've learned, uh, which is contrary to what you might read in, in textbooks, what happens, what happens is, um, is that uh, the water inside the cell undergoes a transition. It undergoes the transition from easy or ordered structured water to ordinary liquid water, and then back again. So, for example, uh, when a when a muscle cell contracts, before it contracts, the water is in the easy or structured state, and when it contracts, the water and the proteins undergo a transition, and um, yeah, it's it's well known that that the proteins undergo transition, but the water, the evidence points to the fact that the water undergoes a transition as well. So, um, and then when the muscle is finishes its uh, contraction, the water reverts back to its structured or easy or fourth phase uh, state. So the cycle, the cycle of transition of water uh, for, from the structured state to the unstructured and back again, is absolutely central to um, to cellular function, which in turn means that if you don't have, if your cell is not filled with easy water, then the transition that I just mentioned uh, either uh, takes place in a kind of feeble way or even and not at all, and your cell is dysfunctional. So the bottom line is that in order to to maintain health. Um, their cells need to be filled with easy water, which in turn means that if you want optimal performance, uh, you got to do all that you can do to make sure that your cells are filled with easy water. Otherwise, they won't function properly. Uh, going back to the the muscle example, you know, if you if you want to um, uh, to perform. Um, uh, either some athletic feat or perhaps a couple of matches of tennis or whatever, you need to make sure that that your cells are filled and with easy water. And how do you do that? Well, there there are, are a half dozen simple expedients that um, you can you can employ to make sure that your cells are filled with it. And you know, if you if you ask me, I can I can go through those. But essentially, uh, let me say that. This is this is essentially hydration. The cell needs to be hydrated. We all know that hydration is important for function, um, but hydration, um, what we've learned, uh, hydration really is filling your cell with easy water. That's hydration, and and for for proper performance, your cells need to be hydrated. So. Um, if you if you want to know more, please ask me. But I think you've got. <laughs> so, what, uh, the, what are the six things that uh, like six top things would you say could? Okay, be? well, the first is the most obvious one is drink water. Uh, yeah. 
you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> and don't drink what I have inside here, which is coffee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I apologize for that, but I'm hooked. <laughs> it's <Okay>. dehydrating. <laughs> uh, it's it's said to be uh, dehydrating. I, I I I'm not sure, but at any rate, what happens is you drink the water, and some of the water that you drink um, uh, turns into or gets converted by the body into easy water, and the conversion depends on actually on infrared energy, and uh, mm -hmm. so. The question is, it might be, well, where, where does the infrared energy come from? Mm. And it's all over the environment. You simply can't get rid of it unless you reduce the temperature to zero degrees Kelvin, which is not so practical. So it comes from the outside. It also comes from the inside because you're generating heat. Mm. Um, and heat is essentially, not exactly, but essentially the same as, uh, as infrared energy. So you've got infrared energy coming from the core of your body during metabolism and from outside. So you drink the water, some of it gets converted to easy and, and can replenish your cells. So that's, that's number one. A second, second one is to drink um, a special kind of water, um, water containing easy um, and, um, and many waters, for example, many spring waters, uh, contain uh, varying uh, amounts of easy water. So you you then bypass uh, the step of conversion. You, you drink it directly. And a good way of getting it, uh, perhaps the optimum way, is to, um, to go to your backyard and cut some uh, freshly grown uh, uh, plants, leaves, and squeeze the water out of it. So what are you squeezing when you do that? Well, you're squeezing the water from inside the freshly grown plant cells, and that water is easy water. So that, that's the reason why a lot of health practitioners suggest that you do this so-called juicing. Um, it may not taste that good, but you can add a bit of flavor to it. And, um, um, and, and the reports are that almost, almost irrespective of whatever syndrome that people are facing, uh, it works. Uh, they come back two or three months later, and not only have they lost weight, but but also they're healthier. And so so that's that's a second um, way. Mm -hmm. The third way uh, is to go out in the sun, um, and mm -hmm. uh, the weather here in the Northwest in Seattle uh, r resembles the weather that you experience, I think, in 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 London. It's kind of gray very often, and. And the sun, um, especially in the winter time here, the sun, uh, it, sunshine is rare. <laughs> and, and when the sun does come out, everybody's feeling good. Uh, smiles, you see smiles on their uh, faces. And you now the usual interpretation, the usual interpretation is, um, well, you know, it's a psychological effect. And, and indeed it might, it, it may well be, but there's another, another possibility that is, you know, sunshine, we think of the sunshine as providing light, but roughly 50% of the energy from the sun is in the infrared region of the spectrum. And um, and so the infrared light then penetrates your skull. And we know that infrared wavelength, many of the wavelengths do penetrate your skull because you can do imaging of the brain, starting with uh, infrared energy coming from outside. So. So it must penetrate the skull, get scattered by the brain, and be and scattered and then recovered outside by an imaging device um, that then converts the, the scattered light into an image of your brain. So it does get through. So a possibility is that the infrared energy from the sun, when the sun peeks its head out, uh, is building easy water in the brain, and therefore um, it builds. Having built easy water, um, the brain reverts to to it. You might say a baseline or a default condition, which is feeling good. Um, um, you know, not depressed or unhappy. So, mm -hmm. okay, so that's another, and um, and a fourth a fourth one is uh, to go into um, into the sauna, or as the Finns say, sauna. Mm -hmm. um, so, what does that do? Well, essentially, it's heat. Mm. Whether it's dry or moist, it's heat, and heat, uh, as I mentioned, is is roughly equivalent to infrared energy, uh, and infrared energy builds easy water. So 
you know, almost irrespective of what your problem is when you enter uh, the sauna, uh, when you come out, you feel better. Mm -hmm. And and there are, there are many explanations. And uh, for me, the simplest explanation is all of that um, highly abundant infrared energy is building easy water and replenishing your cells throughout your body to to their uh, optimum state. Okay, so that that's four. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's four. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. A fifth one um, is um, taking various substances that have been known known since um, Ayurvedic times or ancient Chinese times as being good for health. So, a typical example, which you know very well, is turmeric. Okay. So we we take turmeric, and for almost whatever ails you, <laughs> and and the question is, well, why is it so effective? Um, so hypotheses are uh, one is well you've got turmeric receptors scattered throughout your body in all the different tissues and and that's a complicated one um, a simpler one is is that the turmeric impacts uh, some substance that then penetrates to all the cells in your body one 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 simple mechanism and of course we thought about water um, right because water disperses itself throughout throughout your body. And we found indeed, um, we, we, we studied uh, a half dozen and then some additional substances and known for thousands of years to be good for health. And every one of them built easy water, expanded easy water. So you take turmeric, you know, in reasonable dose, and it turns out that the easy, uh, the amount of easy water in, increases. It's what we found. And some of those substances are amazing, uh, like ghee, you know, um, um, clarified uh, butter. Um, that produced uh, exclusion zones almost a millimeter in size. You know, you can just see it with your naked eye. It, uh, it's, it, it was really quite, quite amazing. And, and of course, the cultures from ancient India know that um, ghee is, is good for health. So that, that's a fifth one. And, and right. there are... Yeah. A whole bunch of substances, and the opposite, by the way, um, uh, is is uh, like substances that are not good for your health. And one of those substances that we we looked at or uh, we we considered is glyphosate. You know the the ingredient in weed weed killer. We here in the U.S. it's Roundup. I'm not sure what it is what it is in U.K. Maybe the same name or a yeah. different different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we found that at every concentration we tested, uh, from the, the the most minute amounts to hefty amounts, diminish the amount of easy water. Um, so I mean, it's 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 possible, mm -hmm. and anesthetics also, which you know at least temporarily impair function, also diminished um, the the amount of uh, easy water. So. Um, you know, and, and this leads to the su su suggestion, um, uh, you know, that that um, for good health, uh, or it leads to, it lends support to the hypothesis that these substances that have been known since Ayurvedic times to, to improve health, at least one possible explanation is that they build easy water. Okay. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, a, a sixth one there are a few more but you know i uh, um the sixth one is connecting yourself to the earth uh electrically mm, now so, so what does that do so-called earthing you would say earthing we would say grounding, grounding. Yeah. yeah 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 uh, uh, i did chinese martial arts and chai chi and qigong which is all about oh. grounding <laughs> And uh, barefoot as well, walking barefoot and things like that. Yeah. Well, there you go, walking barefoot. Uh, yeah, on the on the sand near near the water or on wet grass or uh, what have you. So, yeah. what does it do? Well, um, um, there are many theories. It seems to be pretty effective, um, and, and there are companies you know that have sprung up to provide various kinds of apparatus, uh, is, uh, which can connect you to the ground, um, and and. And so I think the explanation is is straightforward. And of course, it relates to, to easy water. So if you connect yourself to the earth, you know, I learned as an uh, electrical engineering undergraduate student, uh, I was taught that if you, if you um, 
I, if you connect um, uh, a, a plug to a receptacle, that third prong, um, you know, which is ground, connects you to the earth. And and no professor ever said anything about the earth being uh, having net negative charge. Uh, we always assumed it was zero. It was grounded. It was neutral. But but it turns out that that's wrong. And and um, this is a product of the maybe the deficient um, educational system in in the U.S. Because it turns out that the evidence that the Earth is negatively charged is a, hu a huge repository of negative charge. The evidence is overwhelming. It's just that nobody bothers to teach it, even even to students of electrical engineering, of which I was one. So it came as a shock, if you pardon the expression, a shock to me, um, that the earth is negatively charged, but the evidence is ample. Um, okay, so what does that mean? So if you, if you walk barefoot, you're connecting yourself electrically to a vast uh, storehouse of negative charge. Now, so what does that negative charge do? Well, we found in the laboratory that if you take a, a beaker of water and you stick a couple of electrodes in and pass current, we found that next to the negative electrode, uh, EZ water forms. That is, it converts ordinary water into EZ water. And that sort of makes sense because EZ water typically has negative charge. You see, so you put negative charge, put electrons in out of the negative electrode, and it converts the ordinary liquid water to EZ water. So I think the same thing is happening when you connect yourself uh, to the negative earth. Um, what, what that does is um, it, it, it provides negative charge, builds EZ water. And, um, and so that, that's what confers health. So those, those are the half dozen that I would uh, suggest um, that, you know, expedience for good health. Mm. Excellent. Okay, I think I should stop there. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a good time to ask George as well. Like, what are your, uh, those are like um, Jerry's top six. Um, what are your, uh, do you have any others, George, that you want to add to that? I I would uh, say, I, 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 I was taking some notes as we went along. And so well, how about if I knows, uh, well. <laughs> just kind of go over and uh, add my perspective to the kind of things that he was talking about. Okay, yeah. first of all, uh, I believe in perspective, Jerry should be getting a Nobel prize for, for what I call easy gel, but we'll, we'll call it easy water. for. Well, you're very kind. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, be, um, and because this is a foundation of life and I can personally attest that my, uh, my muscles are harder and stronger uh, because of the uh, electrically expanded water that I inhale, and I'll I'll get the connection to the easy in just a second. But as you say, the the uh, the cells are plumped with the easy gel of uh, water, and the um, and the blood flows because of easy water. I'd love if you told the story of how uh, your student knocked sure. on the door before you're meeting. I, I, that that's priceless. But the uh, uh, so and it, it 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 we've shown. And it's provable that the heart itself doesn't do all the uh, circulatory. If it wasn't for this easy water, uh, uh, some sort of ion uh, propulsion, uh, we would not have a circulatory system that function. And if it wasn't for the slipperiness, like the the easy water when it's coating the uh, the various cell surfaces and arteries, arteries and veins and capillaries, uh, the capillaries are what is it, half the size of a, a red blood cell? So yeah. it actually has to shrink down into, it looks like a sausage when it's going through the uh, uh, capillaries, just really squeeze down there. And it couldn't slide if it wasn't all that slipperiness to just let it go through and then do all the ion exchange and everything that it has to do to uh, give the cells what it needs and take the, cell, the byproducts from the cells to get them back and, and eject them. This is critical our body would stop dead without it so like i say i i am very impressed now <laughs> i remember when you were when i was speaking of bad soda in 2019 uh you asked the question what does uh, electrically expanded water which is part of the browns gas do to uh, uh affect the easy gel water and the um and you and you said at that point, and I, and I kind of grinned because I remembered it here. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. 
the uh, <laughs> you're, you're the expert in the easy water. There's no question. So uh, you you and I got together and we assigned uh, Kurt to uh, to do some exploration. And one of the things he discovered was that yes, indeed, the electrically expanded water, when it's present, uh, increases the uh, the thickness of the and and cap and production of the easy water. So that's another thing that increases it. And that's important because we need to have that in our body. So I'm going to add a seventh mm. to your sixth list. It, it just incorporates right in there because, for example, on your number six, uh, we're essentially putting electricity or electrons into the body. And yeah. we can show that the electrically expanded water is, uh, is a, as a, it's still H2O, but it's expanded into a, a plasma form of uh, H2O. Uh, because it's sucked up extra electrons, like a sponge soaks up water. Uh, the, the water is soaked up electrons until it's become a gaseous form of water uh, that is not water vapor or steam. So this, when you bubble this through water, then those electrons, a lot of them are released into the water, and the, those electrons help build the uh, electrically, or sorry, the easy water uh, layer. And if you do it long enough, and and I I sent some uh, video to uh, Mark just before the show, I thought I sent it a couple hours. I sent it to you as well, Jerry. So uh, you'll be able to look at video where a long period of time without washing the uh, surfaces of the jar at the hy hydro uh, uh, um, felix surfaces. I, I, can't, I have to keep- Hydrophilic, yeah. 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 <laughs> the, um, uh, we, we, it, it builds up a layer. We're, we're talking at least a millimeter thick. You can easily huh. see it. And, and then by that time, the agitation in the water starts to actually peel it off and you'll get these floaters in the water. So you actually have this translucent floaties in the water from this uh, from this gel that, that uh, forms. And uh, and of course it's healthy and you can drink it and, and all that. And Mark was saying, well, let's do something with it, but I don't even know how to mass produce it. So we're, we're still at that, that uh, stage. But what I'm saying is, uh, first of all, you can you can put it in the water so that comes back to your points one and two because you want to drink water but you want to drink water with easy in it and that's what the browns gas is doing then of course uh so in, in addition to drinking um, the water from cells which you can get by the juicing and stuff uh you can get the uh, you can actually make water with easy in it so the uh and of course the infrared and is something everybody should be doing anyway, but we're also noticing that if you just shine infrared light onto your water, uh, it, it will increase the easy zone in the water itself. So that's another thing a person can do. In addition to radiating yourself, you can radiate your water and then when you drink it. But the other thing is when you inhale, like I'm doing right here, when you inhale the Brown's gas, you're actually um, breathing in the electrically expanded water. So that helps create the easy water inside your body. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, it gives the cells, uh, the red blood cells a charge as well. Uh, recently, we went through a couple of years of a pandemic and this particular disease, which I won't bother mentioning right now, uh, has the effect of stripping the iron, the heme or, or ferritin out of the red blood cells making it really difficult to uh, for the red blood cells to accept oxygen from the lungs. And then the body becomes very low in oxygen. Your oxygen rates go down. Even if, even if you have a lot of oxygen going in, the blood can't accept the oxygen. Well, it turns out when you're inhaling the Brown's gas, because it's of electrical charge, it puts a charge on the red blood cells so it can accept the oxygen, even though it doesn't have as much iron as it normally would. Interesting. And the people can start within minutes, there's, their oxygen levels come back up and they're able to start breathing again. This, again, it comes back to, I believe, the easy water, because unless that exists in there, the, the electrically expanded water has nothing to work with. So mm. the, the two work together. They're, they're, they're uh, whatever you call it when, when they work together. Anonymous. Uh, <laughs> yes. All right, everyone's back. Yay, thanks, guys. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> we were just saying, like, saunas have infrared lights in them, most of them, don't they? So they're combining the heat and the light. So is that kind of doubling the effect, do you think? Or... Uh, well, uh, yes, yeah. absolutely. And I, I think that uh, and I have a sauna in my house, and we inhale. The, uh, it's one of those silver ones, the single chair, and your head is out. 
And so we inhale the Brown's gas at the same time as uh, having our sauna treatment. Yeah. And one thing I read about was to do with Aborigines who discovered how to go for weeks without uh, or many days, maybe without water by having certain seeds that create the uh, which I think create the easy gel. Because um, when I've done um, microgreens using chia seeds, I can sort of see this very thick gel everywhere. Uh, so is chi are chia seeds one of the... Uh, I oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, powerfully so. Um, yeah, that, and the gel that you're talking about is is filled with easy water. Uh, uh, you know, we we determine that. Um, uh, you know, we, we have a, a measure of, of easy water, and that is a light absorption in in the UV range of around 270 nanometers. And and uh, the chia seed uh, absorbs the water, converts the water in, into easy. And, uh, and we tested that by looking at the absorption of light at 270 nanometers, and, and there it is, like gangbusters. It's just full of easy water. And... Uh, so yeah, uh, and, and that 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 explains why in you know in in various cultures, uh, uh, long distance runners, for example, would would um, take uh, hydrated chia seed um, uh, and and chew on it, and and that gave them lots of easy water and therefore lots of energy uh, to proceed. So yeah, chia seed is like a, a champion builder of easy water. Mm. Yeah, I sprinkle it in my like cereal or stuff. Well, that's why you look so healthy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I my my health really was game changing after meeting George because <clears throat> I started <clears throat> using this machine, like which is the Osmo Infinity, which George makes for yeah. us. It's the AquaCure, yeah. basically similar machine, and uh, yeah, I lost a lot of weight and uh, gave me more energy. Um, um loads of great things my skin's always really good and people that i i do get about an hour a day consistently yeah. and i drink hydrogen rich water as well which george again sorry i'm i'm cutting in because you were on number seven which was brown's gas electrically expanded water and that all makes sense yes and i, I love the thing there. that Jerry yeah. talked about was the electrons and the earthing yeah. and uh that could lead us over into first of all we see that the electrically expanded water adds electrons and all that. So it, it just all comes together. But it also leads us over into this aspect of a battery where you can, where you, uh, because of the negative and positive zones in the water that the EZ does, you can theoretically, and especially if we can make larger EZ zones, so you can have a very thick layer of the gel, uh, you can you can possibly make uh, very powerful batteries fairly easily if uh if we just and charge them with radiant heat, like you just charge it, it, it builds its thing for the most part. But the um, so I wanted to say, I believe that's happening in the body as well. So you're 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 not only providing the circulatory system, the uh, ion propulsion to make it work and the slipperiness, but you're also providing the energy, a lot of the energy necessary. And and like uh, Jerry said, when it comes back and forth, between the water switching between the uh, easy phase and the and the uh, just regular water phase, uh, this sort of thing is happening with these ions as well. Electrons, it's just it all comes together. If it and it and it's basic. This is all basic stuff. Our whole none of the cells of the billions are there would work without it. It's well, I you know I I, I think you're right. The classical view of where we get our energy, as as you know, um, comes from the idea that it comes from the high energy phosphate bond of ATP. Um, but you know, then you have the people who don't eat, the so-called breatharians, and you know, you wonder, well, where where do they get their energy? Well, so um, so the, then the idea is, well, maybe as 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 you point out, um, the the electrical energy that comes from the EZ, the separation of charge, is working in the body as well. Well, why shouldn't it? So if you go back and look at the evidence um, for the role of ATP, it's actually not so clear. So it was, I think, seventy or eighty years ago that a, a prominent physical uh, physical chemical uh, group. Um, found or identified that ATP has a high energy bond and 
And the idea put forth was that this high energy bond is where we get our uh, our energy. Um, but a year later, as pointed out on the website of Gilbert Ling, who passed recently, gilbertling.org, I think it still it still exists. He points out that one year later, another group, another physical chemical group, um, challenged that view and said that these guys a year ago made an arithmetic error. There is no such thing as a high energy phosphate bond. Now, apparently nobody's ever followed up. So we don't know whether the original finding was correct or uh, the challengers were were correct. And this this desperately needs resolution because if if the challengers are correct, it means the whole ATP idea, high energy uh, bond is is out the door. And if it's out the door, then the question is, well, where do we get our energy? And so we circle back to the comment that you made just made uh, George that it's possible that the body possible we don't know it's possible that the, the body runs on electrical energy with so many things run on electrical energy and 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 we know there are all kinds of electrical phenomena throughout the body so it wouldn't come as a complete surprise that we run on electrical energy it's not so clear it remains to to be explored but it's a distinct possibility thanks for bringing it up yeah well, they, they can see that the it, and there's people that can actually visually see it, but you can measure the biomagnetic fields around the body. So you know there's got to be electrical flow in there because you can't have uh, a static electricity won't make an energy field like that. There has to be a flow, an energy flow. So that that's another thing that that tells us there's something to look for. There's something uh, and, to look for, right? And it and it uh, it also occurred to me to uh, uh, to remind me that one of the reasons what makes this so slippery, the easy water so slippery, is it has a negative charge, a net negative charge. So when you have a net negative charge on the red blood cells and a net negative charge on the capillaries, veins, and, and arteries, and the surfaces of them, the two negatives uh, uh, um, push Pretty away bad. from each other. Yeah. And, and that's part of what makes the slipperiness as well, So it, as this whole thing is going through. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good point because you know it, it. It looks as though it's a it's a plumbing problem. You know that nature screwed up because why would you make a pipe a, a capillary narrower than the stuff that needs to flow through? It's sort of like your toilet. You know, sometimes the toilet gets stuff, and and in order to uh, to clear it, you you need to take a plunger and you need to exert a lot of energy to do that. So some people calculated um, how much energy is is required to squeeze those red blood cells down so that they can pass through. And of, of course, the low friction is, is is certainly one, but nevertheless, the calculations uh, that I've, I've seen show that if the left ventricle, if the pressure built by the left ventricle were solely responsible, it would need to develop a, an enormous amount of pressure to drive those red blood cells. And the calculations done by a Russian group, um, they're good at calculations, uh, uh, show that left ventricular pressure would need to be something like one million times of, of the actual left ventricular pressure. So even if they're off by a few orders of magnitude in their computations, still, this is a big problem. And, you know, the problem gets resolved if 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 there's, as you were alluding to earlier, if there's a flow, if, 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 if there's um, uh, some kind of driver in the capillaries themselves that drive the red blood cells too. In other words, a force that complements uh, the, the force of uh, left ventricular pressure. And that's what what we we discovered, um, uh, you, were, you were pointing to. In the laboratory, we discovered if you take a tube made of a hydrophilic material. Uh, tell, tell the story of where the student knocks on the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, student knocks on the door. So, uh, okay, so... <laughs> You know, so we found uh, we we this was this was some years ago, and we were using a, a polymer called Nafion, which are really pretty good at developing uh, uh, an EZ. So we began using it, and we discovered that it also it also came in tubular form. Um, and so I asked one one undergraduate student who was working in the lab. We've had many at uh, working in the lab to explore and see if with the cylindrical geometry, whether it was really possible uh, that 
despite the curvature that still there would be an EZ. And quickly within a week, he found, yes, there was. And I was too busy um, at telling him what to do next or suggesting what to do next. So full of initiative, he starts exploring. And, and a week or two later, he knocks at my door. Uh, we doesn't exactly knock. He, he kind of pushes the door of my office open. And I was speaking to um, some guy and I, I, I got it with him. I don't remember who it, who it was, but it was not so interesting. <laughs> and I was kind of happy when this undergraduate student barges in. Um, you know, um, he, I, I usually leave my door slightly ajar. I don't like to keep it closed. So he pushes it open and said to me, uh, you know, I found something interesting and I, I want to show it to you. And I was actually secretly pleased that he interrupted the conversation because the conversation was not so interesting. <laughs> and he said, you know, I stuck this tube um, in, in the water and the tube was oriented horizontally. So, um, and he said, I noticed that, that um, there was flow inside the tube, like inside a straw and it keeps going, never stops. And, and he said, I thought it was really important. So I wanted to let you know. And, um, and I thought, oh my goodness, if, if, if what he claims to have seen is correct, is extremely important because, because usually, you know, you need a, like a pressure gradient uh, to drive the flow because water has viscosity and um, it work is done. And in order for work to be done, you need an energy supply. And, and we had just found um, that, that the infrared energy is, is a, is a driver. So I thought if this, if this student is right, it, it adds strength to the finding that the infrared energy is doing doing the driving, and we quickly confirmed that he was correct. So this was a, this was a major finding, and then then we came to um, without going through all 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 details. We thought about well, what about could could the same principle this sort of um, flow um, uh, driven essentially by infrared energy could this be a um, applied to the in the cardiovascular system and we did the experiment and we found indeed that that is the case so so our conclusion uh, and we're still trying to get the paper published um, we submitted to uh, quite a few journals and mostly they reject it without review saying oh you know it's uh, um, it doesn't fit our, our journal and you know it, whenever there's a revolutionary finding journals or uh, editors are fearful um, because they may get criticized and such. So of course it's, um, it's a challenge to, to get it uh, published, but we found in, in, indeed that when we add infrared energy, um, uh, the, uh, when the heart is stopped, first of all, the heart is stopped, the flow continues. This is a kind of surprise to many people, but uh, it's been reported previously, maybe a half dozen different different um, uh, groups have reported it over the past century. And, and of course, nobody pays attention to it because it doesn't fit. But you stop the heart, you know, and the flow continues, although lower lower velocity. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a no brainer that there's gotta be something that's driving the flow that's beyond the heart because the heart's not doing it anymore. And so we surmise that it might be this flow phenomenon that I, uh, I just described. So we added um, to this, the, the, we stopped the heart and the flow continued. We added infrared energy and, and flow increased by a factor of three times, uh, you know. And so it looks as though the, the conclusion that we draw is is that um, that in the cardiovascular system, there are two sources uh, of flow. One is obviously the heart, uh, which is generating pressure, which drives the flow. But also beyond that, the vessels themselves are propelling flow. You see, and and uh, you know, if we're correct, of course, I think I think we are. If we're correct, it, it means this is a, a, a new paradigm for the cardiovascular system because it means that for all of us here and, and, and those of us watching or listening, it's not just the heart that drives the blood, it's the heart and the vessels. So I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks for the prompt, George. <laughs> but, that, but that again, see, it comes back to this is Nobel Prize stuff. Like how, I, This is like uh, penicillin. This is, this is world changing. And it's and it's interesting that the uh, uh, publications <laughs> won't touch. Well, it. that's usual. Uh, it's, it's, um, 
Not right, can I uh, can I ask both of you something? Uh, because I've I've done martial arts, kung, uh, Chinese, learned the Chinese uh, martial arts, and and the, which ends with Chinese medicine actually, and then like they they have the notion of meridians and energy channels in the body, like this dude here, uh, which is these however many there are, I think twelve energy channels um and like what do you think about this has has there been any evidence of this in your work jerry especially or do we, what do you think about these as energetic channels or in the body uh w well um we we have not done anything uh in that i mean i could speculate but but um it would just just amount to speculation it it, it could be for example that these channels are uh, channels with with um, especially high concentrations of EZ, but but we have no evidence for it. So maybe I should just keep my mouth shut. Okay, Did, ditto. I get, <laughs> I, and that's that. But that is one of the things that I will say is I'm an inventor and essentially a glorified mechanic. And uh, but as an inventor, you have to question the status quo. You can't ever make something new unless you imagine something different. Mm -hmm. And just because you can imagine it doesn't make it true. But and and most of my experiments fail, <clears throat> at least 99% of them. So a person has to get really used to being a fail in order to be a success. <laughs> right. But that 1%, that 1% where I discover something that no one else has, has uh, um, uh, can do, it just makes up for everything. It's, it's quite it. amazing. But, you, but, you, but just because you can't measure something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. This is one of the things that, uh, it, that, that science is kind of missing these days, is if they can't measure it, it doesn't exist. And, that, and it's, unfortunately, that isn't true. There's a lot of things you can't measure that definitely do exist. I'm with you on that, George, uh, totally with you. And, and it leads to the area of consciousness, for example, and how that may impact water. Uh, which we're beginning to study now. I mean, th there's there's now really abundant evidence that uh, water has the capacity to store information. It comes from many quarters. And uh, at our um, our annual uh, water conference, which you attended and, uh, and presented in, in uh, uh, 2019, it's coming up again in a couple of weeks, uh, uh, many people present uh, evidence, uh, different types of evidence, all of all of which uh, demonstrate uh, objectively that water can store information. Uh, uh, but of course, um, con conventionally oriented physics and chemistry they reject that out of hand, and for the reasons that you suggest exactly. You know, we we can't exactly measure it, although you know people have been making measurements that that. Seem, seem to show it, um, but there's a lot of resistance. Um, science has become um, uh, unduly conservative, and 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 this is the death of science. You know, when when revolutionary ideas come up um, and they're summarily rejected, um, we went, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, you know, science advances through revolutions and. And these are the kinds of revolutions that um, need need to be, or potential revolutions need need to be considered because, um, uh, you know, the world is, has so many problems uh, right now, increasingly so. And typically, you know, when you have a have a, a new scientific finding, it always leads to technologies that you could never have dreamed of uh, previously. And these technologies, many of the technologies, could conceivably be brought uh, into play in trying to solve the problems of the world. So in theory, science should be completely open to to these ideas, and many of which may turn out to be wrong, as you, you suggested, but some of them could turn out to be right. So I if you if you try to count the number of scientific revolutions that have occurred, in the past, say, 30 or 40 years, and I've asked this question to many, and they, they look at me sort of dumbfounded. I, and the question is, can you identify um, a scientific revolution that's actually taken place successfully, um, and not a technological revolution like an iPhone or something, but a scientific revolution equivalent, say, to the splitting of the atom or the genetic code, both of which took place like 60, 70 years ago, um, you know, and and 
and it's really difficult to think of um of a scientific revolution that's changed everybody's lives the way those have what's the reason for it and i think the reason is the increasing conservatism of the scientific endeavor um and and it's the granting agencies that are largely responsible they don't mean to be responsible but the way they're constructed you know if you have if you have a um, a revolutionary idea the people who review it are the people you're challenging <laughs> and so you know you can you can imagine the outcome and yeah. and so <laughs> people you know people with imagination and uh, uh, scientific ideas they understand this and they keep quiet uh, in in general they they know that their career is at stake if they become known as a revolutionary because the people they're challenging don't like it um, they don't want to be displaced so yeah good that you brought that up george yeah and i and it, it, when i when you're talking i remember things like uh, we lost luke montier this uh, this last year. right and uh, and the, and the and the changes he made with water and uh, and making dna uh, yeah. transmittable like this with uh, frequencies and stuff that that being one example of that kind of a revolutionary thing mm -hmm. that uh, and all the the uh, transmutation that I've been discovering, where you can actually turn water into virtually any material on Earth. That's a that's a whole another subject. But I'm just saying these things exist. It actually happens. It's measurable. Uh, and it occurs to me that even just the EZ, if if you go with the capillary system, you could actually build pumps that self pump water. Yes. Yes. And, and if you can self pump water, you have energy that you can actually use to turn turbines if you need to absolutely yeah sure it's the really... sun shines or there's just heat from the earth or whatever the case may be to keep the radiant heat going in and and it goes solid state crazy uh it's yeah it, it, it's almost unimaginable um what what can come of that you're you're absolutely right um mm. so um uh mark i i unfortunately need to go in the next couple of minutes um uh, yeah so... yeah um, that's cool uh, yeah uh, so can I ask you one final question then sure. yeah uh, yeah which is um based on the research you're doing at the moment and to date with your students and so on uh what would you like to see happen in the future for this research you're focused on uh applications uh beyond in merely uh health so easy Easy water exists everywhere. Um, uh, whenever you have a hydrophilic surface, easy will build next to the hydrophilic surface, and and, and all you need is uh, infrared energy uh, to power that that build up. So it's not just in the body, but it's um, it's almost everywhere. And uh, one example is weather. Um, you know, we're we're all suffering now from the ravages of climate change, and if you um, if you ask uh, an atmospheric scientist uh, about about climate, uh, uh, about weather, which is actually you know the essence of of climate, and 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 ask them, hey, could you could you tell me from from first principles? Could you explain um, a rainfall? Could you explain why how clouds form and so you get blank stares. They they really don't understand it, and and. Um, so um, I've addressed that and um, I'm addressing it. It's just one example of where the application of, of EZ um, will play, I, I believe, a dominant role. And in, in a book that is forthcoming, just waiting for my son, who's the artist, who's now in the process of remodeling his home as soon as he finishes and takes care of the cover and a few more illustrations that hey, it'll be it'll be out and mm. and one of the main points um in the book is is weather and and other other applications of ez and electrical charges that pervade nature in ways that uh, i believe we we had not previously understood so yeah mm. so applications of mm. the easy phenomenon beyond human health mm. is is where we're we're headed brilliant thank you i can't wait for your new book we've got your other books here as well which i bought oh. on the internet so if anyone wants your books the fourth phase of water and the cells gels and engines of life 
just search for those on the internet and that's where I got them. So right. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And thanks for the penetrating questions. I appreciate it. And great to see you too, George, again, uh, okay. as always. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Jerry. Get, get your thing going there. <laughs> okay. Now that you're home. Yep. <laughs> All right. Awesome, man. Thanks a lot, Jerry. I'll send you the link to the video uh, sure. later. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Right, take care. Bye. George, please don't go anywhere. Because <laughs> I uh, I just want to... Um, we were going through the list, and we got up to... Uh, we got up to number seven, I think. Or was it eight? Or, but did you have any more, like, of these? Yeah, I didn't... I, I... It just when I was talking, thinking about the weather, one of the things that people don't understand is that ground, like uh, Jerry was saying, has a negative charge. So, and electrons flow from negative to positive. Uh, we have since discovered that. <laughs> and so that when there's a lightning strike, everybody thinks that the lightning strikes down, but it actually goes up. The actual electrons go up into the sky and spread out, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things that uh, people need to... Uh, or, or it's just an interesting thing when you're talking about the weather and mm -hmm. and phenomenon that have to do with electricity. So mm -hmm. it, it, even I still think of the of it going the other way mm -hmm. uh, from the sky to the ground. You get struck by electricity. But if there's a um, a measuring device nearby and people can actually feel it too, if you're if you're strong enough, you can actually feel the electrons building up in that particular area you, your hair starts to stand on end that sort of thing and then all of a sudden the discharge goes up into the sky as the uh, and and it's devastating from the point of we'll call it impact or, or source <laughs> yeah it's one of the, it's one of those things yeah anyway, I, I, wrote, I wrote down uh, two other things that would add like a number eight or a number nine sure. to this list as well that it's not been covered here because pretty much everything has actually in this list, but also I wrote uh, breath work down because it popped into my head as a way of creating. Because I don't know if this is true or not, but it seems like in in martial arts, like uh, Bruce Lee uh, would teach how to stop. So, you know, the kidneys produce adrenaline and it makes the heart pump really fast, and that's not good in a martial arts situation because you're heart rate will go above a certain level and you lose these complex motor skills so your technique goes out the window <laughs> and then uh but yeah they would go like make a shh, 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 shh noise like the shush sound like it would like you're trying to calm a baby who's discomforted or you know you, shh, you know this sort of noise a shh noise does something so i wrote down not just breath work uh, breath work but also sound as well because sound is energy it's a different type of energy because you can levitate rocks with acoustically with sound can't you so so sound light and and when when i was looking at the whole list of things and everything we just talked about it just goes down to good water and good food and um and and and, and getting good uh, sunlight and uh, grounding yourself breathing uh being calm and you know breath work must do something but also sound as well itself like the frequencies of sound could be promote the exclusion zone or they could maybe work the other way depending on the frequencies themselves so yeah that was all i had to add to that yeah, and, and and to expand on jerry's <clears throat> uh thought consciousness is vital like when you when you look at those, uh, I'm going to call it nutritional air breathers, where people can not eat for, I don't know, months at a time uh, and not lose weight or anything like, where do they get their energy from? Where do they get their nutrition from? It is possible, I believe, for the body to absorb something and then transmute it into whatever it's needed. Uh, obviously, I don't know how to do it, but it, but it remains, there is those people that, I don't know, live in caves, gurus we, we hear about that can... Mm -hmm for a long period of time with without eating Absolutely. anyway the consciousness I, I loved what he said about that uh, because i've not heard many professors in academic settings who, who would talk about that first of all and secondly um you know i've learned water divining which is the art of using divination rods or other tools whatever it doesn't matter really but it's the art of connecting with the consciousness of water and knowing where it is and how deep it is and drilling 
a borehole <laughs> to get the water or digging a well. And that's what professional that's professional water diviners do do this job. And we work with them. And I learned this myself and I've done it. So I've proven that works. So there is a consciousness connection with our minds and water. So yeah. how, how you study that, <laughs> I've got no idea. <laughs> well, I I it's kind of passed on at this point. My ex-wife and her mother uh, were water diviners and uh, and they could divine other things as well. Like my ex-wife, um, I used to wear glasses and I lost them in the snow one time. And she divined with her rods right where they were. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 amazing so and it's, the, because, uh, it's because you needed them as well because like when if it was like something you lost that you don't really need that you could easily replace uh, she might have attempted to find it but maybe not successfully but if it was your car keys and your only set or you know whatever it is or your wallet and you and you had you know you it would cause a great inconvenience for you to replace it you you can divine for stuff that you need yeah, it yeah. works. And I know that for a fact. I can tell you, I've looked, I found keys 30 times in the last few years because of just how many keys we've got. There's a, there's four sets on this table. So there you go. There's too many keys everywhere. Anyway, continue. Please. More, people, more people have this skill than they realize because you can actually go online and buy divining rods with the little handles and the, the spinny things. And, and cities, quite a few municipalities actually have them sitting there for... Uh, as tools where they, they'll give them to the guys that go out to find a water main or a sewer line or something like that and do quite well, at, almost as well as the magnetic uh, uh, tools that they that are used. So it's it's a it's definitely something. Again, you can't measure it. How do you measure that consciousness? But, mm -hmm. but it works. It's there. Right. So. Uh Another another point about this um, exclusion zone is Jerry's saying that it has a uh, well in in his books and so on it has a hexagonal structure, which yeah. you know which makes a lot of sense when you we look at if we look at how ice forms structure, we find hexagons like there's loads of cool shapes with snowflakes, isn't there? And like other chemicals involved in the atmosphere, but there's um, there's essentially a hexagonal core shape. Uh, with the exclusion zone and with ice uh, also you can find pyramid shape in ice as well like equilateral triangle pyramids so I spent a long time like trying to work out why does things why do things make this structure and it's it's to do with the bond angles that are created and the radiant energy and the energy we're talking about changing and the structure and the lengths of bonds and the angles and it's created that internal angle of a hexagon and that's the shape uh that we see and uh yeah and then i looked at um you know the hydrogen water bottle that we have in osmio i just didn't realize this for until a couple of years of having one but i kind of really spent time looking at the bubbles of hydrogen and i realized because there's so many bubbles i didn't realize that actually all of them are moving in like a helix shape like this so when i see hydrogen bubbling it, they're all moving in this way like so the energy moves in that way um and it's based on geometry so it's got this uh there's this equilateral triangle and this hexagon are the shapes that we're dealing with there um so and it's a shame that that jerry's not had much time but maybe we'll have to do this on the next video because i really wanted to ask him about how feasible is it to have your hydrophilic surface and your contaminated water and extract this exclusion zone stuff uh h3o2 or whatever it is and then would it would it become is it water in a in a liquid state or is it in a gel state or what is it once you've taken it out of its um uh it's it taken it out of its you know situation it was in when it got formed it comes, it comes back to like uh, this Okay, this is theory. I'm not saying it's fact, but my uh, understanding is when that gel turns back to water, it, it does so when it gives off energy. This is part of the way that it can be an energy battery, and that's how our cells work. So the uh, when the as Jerry was saying, it keeps converting back and forth. It, it gets energy from the radiant energy, turns into the gel, gives energy as it turns back into water on an as needed basis. So mm -hmm. the I, you can see if you if you have the gel on the hydrophilic surface 
and you uh, and you move that surface over into clean water and scrape the gel off, as that gel loses its energy, saying it does, it turns back into water, and it's pure water. Mm. So then, because it's because it's well, that's what I mean. So this could be this could be phenomenal for water treatment. This is what I mean. It could be the biggest game changing discovery for water treatment since. I don't know, distillation or something. I don't know. This could be the biggest, bigger than that. It's the most advanced possible future for, it would make reverse osmosis redundant. It would make distillation redundant. And they're hugely, you know, they're not the most efficient ways of doing it. Um, so we have to get Jerry back and talk to him more about that because that's the real, that's a really game changing thing. You need right. to start uh, putting him together with, uh, with actual engineers and mechanics and stuff that can come up with apparatus because he's, he's got the theory and mm. it's, and it's working and he's proven it. Uh, even if the journals don't accept it, now it's time to actually start building things that use these uh, effects and principles and stuff. Precisely. And I've got an idea about that because the most hydrophilic, Think about uh, one question I was going to ask Jerry, but I didn't kind of realize I kind of answered it myself in a way, maybe. But I've, I've asked myself, what is the most hydrophilic material? What is the most water loving material of all materials in the world? Mm -hmm. and, I, and then he's talking about ghee and he's talking about these, you know, uh, polymers and whatever things he's used. And I thought the most water loving thing in the world is water. Well, water water <laughs> loves itself most of all isn't it it's like um so uh these these meridians that you see in the in, in chinese medicine they are made of a dna helix like structure which is made of something called stable water clusters which have a eight water molecule structure and you can dry this you can evaporate this out of water and when they add so when they distill water many many times uh, and they also do a rotational flow. So the double helix water, these stable water clusters are made in a bio lab. They're made through this fractional distillation and some sort of other processes which involve rotational flow. And I didn't get around to asking Jerry about vortexing and rotational flow, but this is apparent that when you do this, and if you put, if you injected a, so they're using a homeopathic method in this, they're putting a bacteria or something, some contaminant in there, and the um, uh, the impurity is uh, eventually gets completely killed. But what they're doing is growing these molecules as like liquid crystals, and those li liquid crystals are the most hydro water loving things in the world, and they attract a huge exclusion zone. This is why this is theory again, because I've not got jerry or someone to prove that in the lab but that's what i think is going on the most water loving thing is water you know so which, which makes me think that uh, one thing i'd explore is ice ice is solid water and yeah. it, it let's see if there's a hydrophilic uh, um water attracts to it let's see if there's easy zone on it on the surface of ice and then that would be an easy way to turn things over as well well oh we got less than a minute what should we do? <laughs> should we do it again? <laughs> do we want to carry on or should we end it? I don't know. I I, I do need to get on to some other things. So that's cool. Let's it end today. it. We, well, it's it's goodbye from me. <laughs> it's goodbye from beautiful. <laughs> that was great conversation. Thank you, George. And I'll I'll yeah, I'll send you a video of this later on. But yeah, thank you so much for your time.